Now let's talk about patient transfer and patient discharge. Why does the patient get transferred? Change in the patient's condition, resource management, or patient flow. Resource management. If you've got four patients on a unit that can house 18 patients, are you not better served to just move those four patients over to a different floor and not staff that unit with nurses and doctors and clerks? Sure. Patient flow. Um, you know, a patient's going to be moved someplace and they don't have a bed in pediatrics for that patient, so they move them to a regular floor. Just the way patients are moved around involves, you know, resource management, their flow, and of course changes in patient condition is the number one driver and why they get transferred. What's the process? The attending doctor writes an order for the patient transfer. The ward clerk contacts bed utilization nurse or BUN to get a bed assigned. The bed is clean and prepped. The transfer team is notified and report is given. That's between the nurse sending the patient someplace and the nurse receiving the patient wherever they're going. And then finally, it, the patient gets moved. What's the difference between a virtual transfer and the physical transfer? I am so glad you asked. The virtual transfer is when the patient is moved in the computer. The physical transfer is when the actual patient is moved to their new location. And these two events never happen at the same time. This is a really important point. Usually the virtual transfer happens first, and then later the physical transfer happens. Now hopefully there's a short period of time where the virtual location and the physical location of the patient are different. However, studies show this time can be as short as 5 minutes or as long as 20 hours. So you look in the computer, the computer says that the patient is on 4 west in 418, but actually the patient's still in the ER because they haven't been moved yet. Happens all the time. AO2, patient transfer message. The message is part of the virtual transfer and it gets triggered when the BUN, the bed utilization nurse, completes the transfer in the HIS. That causes the AO2 to go downstream to all other ancillary systems. And the typical transfer message has four segments, MSH, it will just look like any other ADT MSH segment. EVN usually only has the event date time information. PID, typically this contains less data than you usually see in a PID segment. For a patient transfer, it usually only has the patient's MRI name and account number in it. PV1, this will have the move to and move from locations in it. So here's a good example of a ADT AO2 transfer message. Standard message header, event segment, just a couple of times in it. PID segment is very basic. Patient's name, medical record number, account number, because they don't need all that other information. All that other information is already in the patient's record under, you know, other things. And PV1, you can see the patient went from CCU bed 4 to West 389 bed 1 at University of Alabama, Birmingham, and they were in the cardiology service. So, University of Alabama, Birmingham Hospital, sorry. That's what that designation means. So, they went from CCU to a regular floor, third floor West. A12, cancel patient transfer message. The cancel patient transfer message is a little tricky. Other than the trigger event code, you would have a hard time identifying it as a cancel message. It doesn't use the NWSCCA codes like you see in an order message. Also, there's no direct identification of which transfer is being canceled. The assumption is that the receiving system tracks all patient transfer messages in chronological order, and therefore the most recent transfer request is the one being canceled. And just like the transfer message, it will have the same four segments with limited information in the PID segment, and the PV1 segment in a transfer message will have almost no information at it all. So here is a A12, an ADT A12, so we know it's a cancellation. Now we know it's a cancellation of the transfer for this patient because it's got his MRN and his name and his account number, and all you see here is that this patient is an inpatient. So, the transfer is a little tricky to spot, but once you see ADT A12, you know it's a cancel transfer message. Patient discharge. The patient discharge process has two steps. First, the doctor has to write a discharge order. 
This order gets placed into the hospital information system, triggering an A16 pending discharge message, and this causes a chain reaction of events called discharge planning. Discharge planning involves setting up follow appointments for the patient, post care instructions, patient account review, and many other activities. Once all the discharge planning activities are completed, now the patient is ready to actually be discharged. The nurse or ward clerk, or ward clerk I can't speak today, will enter the discharge into the HIS system, triggering AO3, which will let all the downstream systems know the patient is now actually out of the hospital and discharged. The pending discharge and discharge messages have limited data in the PID segment. The three the key information in the A16 and AO3 are contained in the PV1 and PV2 segments. So here's the pending discharge message. You can see that again we're talking about Mr. Klein sample. He's an inpatient on West in West 389 and he's going to be discharged. So all the things that have to happen will happen and then he will actually get discharged. So his discharge was written on this day, May 29th, with a planned discharge of May 30th at 1130. And he was actually discharged right on time at 1130. So that's just a little extra for pending discharge, discharge. So doctor says, hey, we're going to discharge this guy. We got to make sure his bill is all up to date. We got to make sure he's got his post care instructions. We got to make sure he has follow up appointments. All that has to be done, and then we can actually discharge him. Thank you for watching.